Dzień dobry, szanowni państwo. Witam państwa bardzo serdecznie na naszym kolejnym webinarze Przemysłu Przyszłości. Dzisiaj będzie poświęcony troszeczkę innym zagadnieniom niż zagadnienia technologiczne, niemniej jednak bardzo ważnym. Ponieważ dzisiejszy webinar będzie realizowany w całości w języku angielskim, więc pozwolę sobie od razu przejść na, na ten język. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to uh, our newest webinar on entrepreneurial mindset. As you probably read the, our announcement and our article on that topic, this is also a very important part of uh, the digital transformation of, of a company towards Industry 4.0. And this is my great pleasure to welcome Professor Paul Coyle, um, who is uh, the founder and the director of the Entrepreneurial Mindset Network. Um, and the network itself uh, promotes and supports individuals and the organizations in their change towards more entrepreneurial uh, behavior and, and competencies. Paul is also author of the book on entrepreneurial mindset, uh, which is based on his years of, of research and practical experience in uh, consultancy. Um, Paul um, has been working with hundreds of organizations over the years, from high education institutions towards uh, uh, top um, business organizations and, and companies. The, the network itself is currently currently has members from uh, seven more than 60 countries all over the world. Paul is also the advisor of European Commission and OECD, as well as the European Institute of Technology on the topic of entrepreneurship in their various um, uh, issues and initiatives. Paul's education um, includes uh, also uh, such an experience as uh, side business school at the University of Oxford, University of Twente, Aston University and Bradford University. Within this, his career, Paul also uh, held a numerous academic positions like executive dean and uh, pro vice chancellor. Without any further announcement, now I will invite uh, Paul Coyle uh, and give him a floor for his presentation. Paul, we can see you now, we can hear you now. Welcome. Great, okay. I'm very hello, happy everybody. to join us today. Welcome. Thank you, Majay. Uh, hello, Great. everybody. Um, as uh, the introduction said, my name is Paul Coyle. I'm the director of the Entrepreneurial Mindset Network. We're a free membership organization and uh, we have members in 65 countries. Uh, the reason that I want to tell you that is I think that the involvement of people from this many countries demonstrates the international significance of the concept of the entrepreneurial mindset. All over the world, people want to understand what the mindset is and how to make practical use of it to gain real benefits. So my vision is that everybody can benefit from having an entrepreneurial mindset. Of course, an entrepreneurial mindset will help you if you want to run your own business. It can help you if you're starting a small business or if you want to scale a startup venture into a larger company. However, you don't need to be the person running the business to benefit from the entrepreneurial mindset. In fact, anyone can benefit from learning to think and act like an entrepreneur. Having the right mindset helps employees in any organization to cope with ongoing change in their work environment. It empowers individuals to be able to make their contribution to the success of their team and their company. Having lots of employees with the right mindset transforms the culture of an organization. A blend of company culture and individual mindset can give a company a competitive advantage by enabling it to be more innovative and agile in a turbulent operating environment. Strategic transformation is challenging and having the right company culture is essential. Equally, having leaders, managers and employees who all possess the right mindset is crucial. And putting it another way, Every individual can act like an entrepreneur and every company can act like a startup. Today, I'll be explaining what the entrepreneurial mindset is, what are its benefits, how you can quickly put it into practice, and I'll be sharing with you some ideas that you can use immediately within your own work context. 
So the context in which I wish to make my comments today is, of course, Industry 4.0. And I want to consider the role of the entrepreneurial mindset in terms of supporting an evolution towards Industry 4.0. I will make three points, first around technology, secondly, innovation, and thirdly, workforce development. Firstly, the technology to support Industry 4.0 is becoming well established. Smart sensors, advanced human machine interfaces, cloud computing and big data, they all combine to reveal a richer and deeper understanding of the manufacturing process than was ever previously possible. Second, these technologies are enabling new innovations, such as intelligent support for workers and increased automation. As a result of these innovations, we can now imagine changes that might deliver smart factories in which different systems will be able to interact with each other and automatically adjust performance to optimize operations and workflow. Thirdly, although advances in technology are creating these opportunities for greater innovation, the opportunities are wholly dependent on successfully managing the necessary changes in the workforce. Employees' roles will change for example, as people learn how to integrate real-time information into work procedures. And new types of role will be created in support of closer integration between departments, functions, and capabilities across the company. It's also likely that there will be a loss of some types of roles, as well as a reduction in the number of employees, as more tasks are automated and people are replaced by machines. So Industry 4.0 offers the promise of change, and by introducing the latest technology, increasing the level of innovation and changing the role of employees, we should be able to gain greater efficiency, higher quality and financial sustainability. And a question you might ask yourself this morning is, is your company prepared for the promise of Industry 4.0? Organisational change is normally seen as a wholly positive and successful activity. So let's think about that. The assumption is that successful transformation will be achieved by leaders simply devising and implementing a plan for change. Investment will be made in new technology, employees will be encouraged to be more innovative and workforce changes will be phased in over time. Leaders will devise a new business strategy for the company and change the existing business model. They'll drive increased innovation through revised structures, inspirational leadership, and a renewed focus on company-wide collaboration. They'll be able to demonstrate return on investment and help the company to become a leader in the sector, the region, and the country. Managers will implement the company's strategic roadmap, and they'll enjoy the full support of top management and be informed by insights from the customer-facing employees. Managers will be able to motivate those employees by promoting the benefits of change and encouraging more of a can-do mindset. New technologies will be identified, investment funds secured, suppliers identified, new equipment sourced and installed. Independent machines and processes will become seamlessly integrated and big data will soon deliver fresh insights. Employees will be eager to learn new skills, including operating new interfaces, working with cobots and overseeing the work of robots. Employees will quickly embrace many changes and will understand their new role within the smart factory. This is how everything will appear on paper, how it will be presented to the board and the investors. The promise of that change is seductive. It appears that all the advantages of Industry 4.0 are easily within our reach. All we have to do is simply devise and implement a plan. And you can ask yourself, what is your company's plan? for change. However, as we all know, these plans for change often struggle to achieve their intended outcomes. Sometimes changes are unsuccessful because they're based on a failure to understand the needs of customers and how those needs change over time. Failure can arise from not understanding what competitors are doing and a lack of innovation to establish a company USP. It can prove very difficult to break with current practices and embrace new ways of working because companies tend to reward conformity and employees understand this only too well in terms of job security and career advancements. Leaders often undersell the need for change or they fail to provide a convincing roadmap 
which would help employees to understand the part that they must play. People are already too busy, so they find it hard to see beyond the daily routine. And even amongst leaders, there can be a heavy bias towards the status quo. Companies tend to use risk averse decision making. Regulations and procedures can mean that it takes a long time to take decisions about new initiatives and change is therefore slow and incremental. People sit back and wait. They assume other people have ownership of problems and it's not their responsibility. So there's a lack of urgency. It's difficult to create a joined up approach against a background of fragmentation, silo working, internal conflicts and power struggles. Overall, studies repeatedly show that a lack of focus on culture accounts for the high failure rate of organizational change. Structural change will be more successful if the underlying mindset and the behavioral norms of the organization are developed at the same time. You can ask yourself, has my company anticipated the likely obstacles to change? I think from the topic of this talk, we'd like to think that maybe startups don't face the barriers to change that medium and larger companies encounter. Certainly successful startups are founded on the basis of a detailed market analysis, which provides a rich customers and competitors. But establishing a USP, the startup culture is one which encourages and rewards risk taking and innovation. They understand how to prototype and generate improvements through it. All voices are heard. It often underpins innovation. People are prepared to work hard and make good use of productivity tools. Organizational structures are flat and communication chains are therefore short. They have a sense of urgency and they're eager to get things done. Decisions can be taken quickly. However, startups do face their own challenges. It can be difficult to establish a place in the market as a smaller player. Innovative concepts can be difficult and services in the short term. Relationships can tend towards the personal rather than the professional. Understanding of professional codes, standards and legal requirements. Risk taking might be reckless rather than planned. Financial literacy can be poor with an inability to generate income and make a profit. And individuals can just be overwhelmed by the number of roles they need to play and the workloads involved. So in reality, there are advantages and disadvantages to both company models, the SME and the startup. Nevertheless, it's useful to try and understand how companies can be more like startups. Individuals can benefit from a real mindset. So should my company try to behave more like a startup? Change is a constant because companies must continue to evolve in a world which is volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous. Even when the intended change is clear, the path can be difficult and filled with obstacles. Knowledge, the necessary facts to help us understand change, we need the right ability to do new things and implement. Above all, we need the right mindset that gives us the confidence to deal with uncertainty and complexity. It really matters whether people, your boss, your colleague, whether those people have the right mindset. Present your great idea to someone with the wrong mindset and they will be able to give you 10 reasons why it will never work. Share your idea with someone with the right mindset and they will say, OK, I'm not sure how, but let's make this happen. With the wrong mindset, you will feel like you just have to put up with the way things are. You'll be unable to see how things could change for the better. Without the mindset, you may well feel demotivated and disempowered. With the right mindset, like an entrepreneur, you take ownership of problems. You see opportunities. You don't sit back and wait. You take the initiative. You say what you really think and you come up with solutions. You make the best use of the available resources. You work to create success your team and your company, and you understand the part you have to play in achieving profitability, growth and competitiveness. The right mindset fills you with confidence and determination.
Mindset is interesting because it blends the organizational and the individual perspectives of strategic change. An entrepreneurial mindset, when well aligned with the company's goals, supports changes in the behavioral norms of individuals, which in turn transforms the organizational culture as a whole. Ask yourself, does my company understand the benefits of the entrepreneurial mindset? It's a myth that only some people can have an entrepreneurial mindset. The behaviours of an entrepreneur can be analysed, defined and learned and applied in many different organisational contexts and settings. So to help this to happen, we use a mindset mnemonic where each letter of the word mindset spells out one essential entrepreneurial behaviour. The mnemonic is based on a systematic analysis of published research and professional practice. The use of the mnemonic is, I think, innovative because it takes the complicated concept of the entrepreneurial mindset and translates it into seven easy to remember behaviours. So let's start with M, meet real needs. This reminds you that successful companies are ones which meet the real needs of their customers. I, innovate, means that we have to create options for change, seek, seek feedback and criticism, try to stand out from the crowd, and be ambitious to go beyond incremental change. N, never act unethically. This responds to the negative perception that some people have of entrepreneurs and it inserts the importance of ethical behaviour. D, dare to take risks. Well, this is a defining entrepreneurial behaviour. S, sell. Entrepreneurs sell and like an entrepreneur, we need to create the case for change, craft a clear and compelling message, inspire confidence, motivate people to take action, build relationships and grow commitment. E, exercise for productivity. We all need to know how to do even more with even less. Increases in productivity don't just happen, you really have to work at it. It's like exercising, like going to the gym, and once you get fit, you have to work to stay fit. Finally, T, take the initiative. As I say, entrepreneurs don't sit back and wait. They take action and get things done. They don't delay. Let's explore one of the seven behaviours in more detail. Uh, D, dare to take risks. From the organisational perspective, we can ask what prevents and what enables risk taking. Encouragement from the top leaders, well, that's obviously helpful. However, in reality, most businesses are risk averse. Established ways of working for having, for example, having to deliver key performance indicators, well, that can be a straitjacket that kills risk taking. Silos between groups inhibits collaboration and hierarchies stop employees taking the initiative. On the one hand, leaders may talk about wanting more risk taking, but on the other hand, there are many signals in, within the company that conformity is rewarded and failure will be punished. Companies rightly want to avoid the potential costs of things going wrong. There need to be mechanisms that can accurately monitor risk taking and shut down activities before any seriously negative consequences. Looking at risk from the individual perspective, well, we need to understand that employees will be very reluctant to change their behavior in an organization with a risk averse culture. Taking risk could lead to meaningful rewards, the opportunity to collaborate with other people in mutually supportive ways, but more, more often than not, the potential downsides outweigh any likely benefits and risk taking is often seen as above and beyond the daily routine. Employees will not take risks if they're unclear about the potential rewards and possible penalties. For example, people are unlikely to take risks if that might jeopardise their chances of promotion. We can see risk from an organisational and individual perspective, and leaders would do well to try and understand what motivates individuals to take or avoid risks. You can ask yourself, am I prepared to take more risks? Let's explore the role of leaders a little bit further in relation to the entrepreneurial mindset. And I hope this model is something that you will immediately be able to make use of. The mindset reminds us that leaders need to M, meet the real needs of their people and S, sell a convincing argument for change. 
For me, this implies not treating everyone the same, but flexing communication according to the needs of the individuals. The simple four quadrants model shown here illustrates some key points. In quadrant one, when performance is strong and you demonstrate leadership, then you coach so that people can sustain that high performance. In quadrant two, when performance is strong and you exercise management, you enable people because you take action to resolve the problems that are beyond their control. In quadrant three, when performance is poor and you use your leadership, you motivate and inspire people to want to play their part. And in quadrant four, when performance is poor and you take management action, you instruct and you are explicit about the consequences of underperforming. The interesting thing about this model is the choice of whether you should coach, enable, motivate or instruct is dependent upon what each person in your team needs to improve or sustain their performance. Your behaviour should not be determined by your personality or your personal preferences. You have to use each of the four quadrants at different times, possibly with the same person, and maybe even flexing between the quadrant, quadrants within just one conversation. What you should not do is fail to operate in quadrant four. Most people try to avoid that quadrant. Central to this idea is that every employee has a contribution to make, and it's the job of the leader to ensure that each person can perform to the best of their ability. And you can ask yourself, do I flex my leadership and management so as to get the very best out of employees and colleagues? OK, let's have a summary. Industry is under constant pressure to improve product quality, boost factory efficiency, stay competitive and remain profitable. Industry 4.0 seems to offer the promise of a step change in meeting business needs because of digital technology and innovation. However, the organisational transformation envisaged by the evolution of the smart factory, that's not straightforward. Hence, I think the growing interest in the benefit of leaders, managers and employees adopting an entrepreneurial mindset. When aligned with organisational goals, the mindset is seen as empowering people to become more productive, more creative and more impactful. The mindset changes the behavioural norms of individuals, which in turn transforms the organisational culture as a whole. Organisational development becomes successful because it's a smart blend of bottom-up and top-down processes. Employees are motivated to play their role, one that enhances the success of the team and the company. Managers can generate high levels of motivation in employees, ensure they make their full contribution. Leaders can role model entrepreneurial behaviours to the whole company so as to create the necessary synergies between all the human and technological elements of production. The region can support new and sustainable manufacturing technologies, attract growth companies and inward investment and build its competitive advantage. And the country as a whole can support economic growth and enhance standards of living. So like a set of dolls from the individual to the manager, to the leader, to the region and the country. The mindset empowers people at all levels to have ownership of problems and opportunities and to take responsibility for the actions that will create value at every level. And you could ask yourself, do I understand how I make a full contribution to my company, my region and my country? Thank you. Yes, I'm back. Thank you very much, Paul, for uh, this great introduction. I must say that one of the main difficulties actually in uh, understanding entrepreneurial mindset, especially in different li uh, linguistic settings, is actually yeah. a is appropriate translation to it. And I yeah. can tell, <laughs> I can totally tell you that uh, uh, we've had a really big uh, difficulty in properly translating what this webinar will be all about and how to <laughs> correctly translate the entrepreneurial mindset into Polish language is not really that easy. 
So thank you for for um, explaining explaining to us that this is that entrepreneurial mindset does not necessarily have to always apply only to people who run their companies. It also applies to people who are within the organizations. So if you allow me, I have prepared a couple of questions to okay. you, and um, let's uh, dig in into the discussion and just a few words to our participants that uh, you are more than welcome to ask uh, questions if you have any uh, you can ask them in Polish and in English whichever is uh, more suitable for you and uh, we will um, pass it on to uh, Paul um, in a later stage of this webinar great so um, after listening to, to all this uh, and uh, if I were the participant probably the big the, the, the first big question would be all right so I'm a company leader I'm a company owner and of course, I would like to my my employees to behave and to to think more entrepreneurially, to take more risks, to be more innovative, and so on. But usually, it's easier said than done. So, where do I begin? Uh, how can I initiate that uh, that mindset change in my company? Well, I think it works at different levels. First of all, um, I suppose you've got to say to yourself, "I'm really interested in this. I I think that there's something important to explore here." And I'm going to put some time aside to find out what the mindset is. Um, I hope that some of the things we've talked about today um, impresses people that the mindset is an important and useful concept. Because I think unless it, unless you can demonstrate that it's going to translate into um, useful benefits for the company and for the individuals, then people are not going to be not going to get involved. One of the things I talked about was that people are already busy. So when you come along with the next initiative, they're going to say to you, oh, we're already doing all these other things. So how does this help? Um, and I think that that's why we use the mindset mnemonic, because I hope that it very quickly says to people, uh, OK, well, we're sort of doing most of this anyway. And that always seems to be a good place to start. And so I think that the mindset becomes a, a new framework to look at existing problems. And what it helps you to do is it prompts you through a set of questions which are useful reflections for the company and for individuals. You know, it seems to me that any company strategy is going to start with, do we meet real needs? Do we really meet the needs of the customers? And how can we do that better? Um, so, uh, and, and that is a great place to start. You know, you could start with that very first question. Let's have a conversation with each other about whether we're really meeting customer needs and whether we are sensitive to the idea that those needs are not static, that they're changing. And are we being innovative enough? Do we have a distinctive approach to meeting those needs? And what are our competitors up to? Are other people already doing this or are they doing it better than we are? And so I think that, the great place to start is to start with some of the basic questions about the company, the roles of people, but to set them within that challenging framework of the entrepreneurial mindset, which is talking about how can we all do this to the best of our ability. Great. All right. Let's move on. Uh, the next question. Yeah. Uh, how can I measure the mindset change. You know, it's uh, yeah, we really to measure because of yeah. course, you know, uh, the theory, yeah. the models, and everything. But usually, yeah. business people ask, "Okay, well, it's a, it's, uh, it's I like this idea. I would like to right. put it in my company strategy, yeah. but unless I can measure it, it's not really going to work." Yeah, no, I, I I agree because you know it has to translate into hard data in terms of you know we're we're going to generate more income, we're going to be more productive, we're 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 going to. Um, uh, generate more profit we're going to be financially sustainable we're still going to be here in five years time we're going to be bigger it has to translate into all those things i would have thought that um the things that we've talked about in terms of innovation higher productivity meeting real customer needs um those do um i think help us to think about how would you measure those things uh, and they can translate into key performance indicators many years ago somebody once said this to me, this is not my idea, um, that it's also useful to think about what will people see and what will they feel and what will they hear. And I think this is quite an interesting way of looking at this. So you could say that employees might see more opportunities to put their ideas forward. Uh, they could hear colleagues saying 
more about what they really think. And I think in turn, you could say employees might feel more motivated. What might managers do? Um, they might see more employee initiatives coming forward. They might hear more ideas for innovation. And they, in turn, might feel that there's more capacity to actually get things done. Um, leaders perhaps would uh, see improvements in product productivity. They would hear high levels of satisfaction coming back from customers. And they might feel proud about their company. So I think that in measuring it, there's an interesting question about absolutely this has to be measured in terms of does it deliver on the key activities, the measurable activities of a company. But I think that that um, other human perspective of how people will feel and what they will see and what they will hear, that's an interesting wider way of looking at the success of, of these initiatives. Um, and as we speak, uh, as we talk about the strategic approach and, 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 the, and the strategy yeah. itself, I think it will be really good if we can um, follow it up with a question uh, from one of our participants, Malgosha, who asks us, um, what is your definition of authentic leadership? I guess you use that that kind of phrase. So how do you understand that? that yeah. That, that, um, Okay, I'll talk about authentic leadership. I think that it's uh, being honest and true with people. Um, one of the things which is uh, embedded in this idea of the mindset is creating a situation where people can say what they really think. And uh, I think that change really depends upon those things. Uh, the other reaction I have to authentic leadership is um, I think that uh, it gives a sort of special le special um, status to leadership, which it doesn't deserve. Okay, so embedded in the idea of the mindset is that anybody can exhibit leadership. You don't need to be in a formal leadership position to lead because we've defined leadership as the ability to sell a case for change, something that you think is important, and motivate somebody else to want to get involved and want to do something. So on the one hand, yes, there is a, a, a lot of research about formal leadership positions and how wonderful leaders are. But I always say to myself, well, if leadership is such a great concept, why is the world in such a mess? <laughs> so, so I think, as I hope it comes through in all of this presentation, on the one hand, there's a recognition that these concepts exist. But on the other one, embedded in this whole idea of the mindset is questioning our assumptions and saying to ourselves, okay, is authentic leadership, is that a helpful concept to us as a company or not? And do we want to uh, talk about what is successful leadership for us? I think that's another, um, another idea here that um, there is no one size fits all. And I think often when you hold up ideas by like authentic leadership, you're left thinking, well, how would I ever be able to do that? Um, there's always this deficit gap. Um, and the mindset is a different way of thinking. It's building from strengths and qualities you already have and making sure that they deliver the company's objectives. So you, there, you can go the other way. You know, the traditional way is always to think about I don't have this. I'm not good at this. If only I could become an authentic leader, I need to find out about that. Then everything will be better. <laughs> okay, um, moving on. Um, let's uh, look at the downside of yeah. Things, okay, and let's try to uh, see if there are possibly any any uh, let's say yeah the dark sides. Do you yeah. think that um, if employees will become more entrepreneurially spirited or more entrepreneurially uh, with more entrepreneurial attitude, yeah. could that actually lead to unhealthy uh, rivalry among them? So their energy will be focused on the internal perspective rather than external perspective. Yeah, you know, let's be realistic. The, whether we're talking about the mindset or not, there are always internal politics. And I don't think the mindset makes that any worse. What it does require is that leaders are open to the possibility that workers would say to them, I disagree with you. Now, I have always thought that that is a really good culture to create because um, that is a creative tension, which actually creates new ideas and new understanding. 
if people are talking about uh, what they really think. Now, I don't think the mindset makes internal politics. That's uh, You've called it rivalry. I don't think that makes things any worse. And I want to stress that the definition of the mindset is not about individualism. Uh, it's not about reckless behavior. It's not about somebody doing something for their own personal benefit. What this is about is encouraging people to take the initiative, to not hold back their ideas, to not hold back what they're good at, but to come forward and take that risk, to be brave enough to put forward their ideas, because those ideas will advance the company. That's the idea. It's all within this framework of it's not for rivalry. You know, we're individually or between departments. The point is, how does this benefit the company as a whole? Um, and I think that that means it implies, let's go back to some of the themes of the of the uh, of the talk. It implies on the one hand that we're imagining that people will get on and that they will cooperate and they'll collaborate. But the reality is completely different, that people don't do that. Um, and that's why there is there are endless books coming out every year about collaboration, because actually we imagine that we want collaboration, but the truth is that it's difficult to achieve. It's very difficult to achieve. So I don't think the mindset makes that any worse, uh, because what the mindset is challenging people to do is to come forward and say what they really think and to take the initiative. Now, um, that can create tensions within companies, that is true. Um, and therefore it's, it's a process which, need, which needs to be managed. But I don't think it's a process which is chaotic. Can you give us any real life examples of successful transformation towards more entrepreneurial mindset model? Maybe you have some good practices yeah. to advise us on. Um, I suppose what first comes to mind is speaking from my own experience. The things I tried in the leadership roles that I had, I worked for 10 years at executive level in higher education in the UK and um, worked on very substantial transformation projects. So um, I was part of the teams that uh, created three new universities in the UK through merger processes. So I think a lot of those techniques that I'm talking about were included uh, in those transformation products. We definitely encourage people to say what they really thought, um, but to do that in a constructive way. And um, we try to make sure that as many people as possible were heard um, because it's my view that companies are packed full of bright people who want to do the best and want to see their company successful. But they don't get a chance to say uh, what they think and bring forward their good ideas. And I think there's when you use this approach, what you find is that more people come on board. Um, the people who are dissenting uh, that you don't know about, once they've had a chance to say what they really think, they tend to get a bit quieter and they tend to become a bit more positive. And nothing is more successful than winning over a critic somebody that other people look to. So once you've run them over, it make a, a big difference. I think you've got to be really explicit about what behaviors you want people to exhibit. We want you to be more innovative. We don't want you to be complaining. If you do complain, have an idea about uh, how things could be improved. I think you have to take these um, ideas, these behaviors and embed them in HR processes, how you recruit people, how you write role descriptions, how you reward people. I would really recommend group training. Group training, you know, instead of sending off individuals one at a time into training activities, if you can go as a group, a group of your colleagues, or if you, what's really powerful is to send leaders, managers and workers into the same training, that's very powerful. And I think as a leader, you have to role model the behavior. In terms of risk taking, I used to be uh, responsible for health and safety because um, I was uh, responsible for um, subjects in art and design where actually you can be killed um, through chemical substances or, or machinery. So it's a, it's a really serious thing. But what I always used to say to the health and safety officer is um, in my view, if the students want to jump off the roof, they can, as long as they do it safely. <laughs> I think that what this says is there's a danger, and you see this in, the, in companies' approach to risk-taking. If you try to approach risk-taking by eliminating risks, what happens is people 
are able to do less and less to the point where they can't do practical activities and companies get like this. And so what I'm proposing, what the mindset proposes is, yes, you can take risks, you can jump off a building if you want to, as long as you do it safely. And there are ways and means to make sure that happens. And I think within companies where you see greater risks taken by individuals or greater risk taken by the company as a whole in uh, investing in new technology or in hiring new people, if those processes are managed correctly and you've got a, you've anticipated where it could go wrong, because inevitably things do go wrong, um, you can manage that process and make sure that you don't have any bad outcomes. And the more risk taking there is, that then means people can be more innovative. And then I think you get this virtuous circle of um, all of the, you know, if you start talking about the mindset in any detail, it's an upbeat, energetic, oh, we're, we're, we're doing this. And you get that sort of buzz or drive coming within your institution. And then really great things start to happen. Paul, cool. let's move to the next uh, item on, of our list and uh, the questions that have been provided to us by our participants. We've already yep. addressed one and um, let's try to address another one. I hope that I, I understand correctly from uh, Andre. How to change the mindset of team members when they are in overwhelming majority and uh, when they are decision makers? How to initialize such change? Yeah, it's a really good question. And I think that this um, uh, this uh, is very true of the situation of, that most people find themselves in. So I've always been long interested in the fact that, so we go back to what do we think change is supposed to be like and what is it really like? So, we, you know, I talked about it today. So the idea is that somebody at the top is going to devise this um, change management process because they think that mindset is important and then there'll be a plan and then we'll train people and then we'll have job descriptions and rewards and incentives and therefore the company will change. In reality what actually happens and may be happening for uh, people on this webinar today is wherever they are in the company and they're probably maybe not at that level they are somebody who believes this is important wants to enact these changes for themselves and for their team. And they are what I call a lone champion. They are a champion for change within the organization, but they have to uh, promote those changes and make them happen, possibly without the support of senior managers or the support of colleagues. And this goes to the heart of the entrepreneurial mindset. It says to you, I think this is an important issue. Therefore, I'm going to do something about it. What am I going to do about it today? And I'm going to do it even though I don't have the right resources, I don't have the right support, and I'm not sure how this is going to work out. And I don't know quite how negative the impact could be on me. But I am going to do this. I'm going to take the initiative. I'm going to take the risk. I'm going to own this problem. And I am going to sell. This is why sell is included in the mnemonic, because quite understandably, what else could there be? Your colleagues don't get this and you've got to try and win them over. And so it becomes a process of selling the benefits to them. And I think that um, in, in creating the Entrepreneurial Mindset Network, it was very much on the basis of trying to provide some support to the many lone champions in organizations who think these sorts of changes are important and would like to make them happen. So what I would say is that that is the, the, the norm, that, that mostly it's lone champions at various levels in organizations trying to make changes. And I would like to just say a little bit more about it in using the, um, the example of entrepreneurship. So I think of entrepreneurship as uh, in three stages, start up, scale up, and I call the third one shake up. So instead of disruption, I use S and it's just because there are three S's, but I think it's, it's easy to understand. Start up, scale up, shake up. Now, when we come to organizational developments, most organizations are in the startup phase. If we think about the types of changes that are implied here, there are one or two individuals, there might be a department, uh, there could be a leader somewhere. But what is really difficult to do is to take this type of initiative and scale it up to the whole company. 
And the reason it's difficult to do is because I think all over the world, we've got a really good handle on startup. We know how to do that. We know how to start projects in organizations. We know how to get new equipment. We know how to put new teams in. What is much more difficult to do is to scale that up to the company as a whole. And I think that uh, there needs to be more thought given to what is the nature of scaling these activities and how do you actually go about doing it? Because I think that in the world, there's a deficit of understanding about how to do that well. But what I would hope is that it doesn't, doesn't discourage the lone champions from doing the wonderful things that they do within companies. You've mentioned plans and that actually uh, goes very well with the next question that we had from Marta. Yeah. The roadmap for a company culture changes seems to be very important. How detailed it should be uh, to announce it to employees? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, that why wouldn't you? Um, one, I think that what tends to, the reason that um, roadmaps and plans don't work is that um, a few people go into a room and they spend a month or a year in there and what they work out is all the great details of their plan. And then they arrive with the plan and they present it to the employees and the employees are not stupid. And they're able to say immediately why the plan will never work. So uh, there's an alternative approach, which is that you decide what are the sort of five big things you're trying to achieve. And you go out in the first stage and you get buy into those five, th five things. Not the details of it, but the principles of these are the things we want to achieve. Do you all agree? Then when you come back with your plan, you've already got the buy-in that you can build on. And that makes the planning process much more successful. What you've got to be, what um, everybody will do as soon as they see a plan is say, uh, how does this affect me? And what's in it for me? What, what am I going to get out of this? And I think that if your plan, if your planning process hasn't answered that question, then you're going to struggle when you present the plan to the employees. But I would be very much in favour of a planning process that involves employees at all levels from the beginning, starts with the principles of what we want to achieve and gets their ideas about how that can successfully be achieved. Good. Um, I think we have a follow-up from Marta asking, uh, saying, I believe that it is worth to communicate what we want to change and what we want to achieve as a result. Yeah. So yeah. basically, I think it blends in very well with what you just said, that you are basically a uh, fan of co-creation of such plans and roadmaps. Yeah, I think so. Because, um, you know, a, another way to think about it is that um, you can't do everybody else's job for them as a leader. What you need them to be doing is all the things that you don't have the time to do. And hopefully... They're doing things that you don't have the knowledge or the skills to do. You know, you want smart people around you. And I think that going back to why I was like oh, authentic leadership, it, it implies that some, some people are different to other people. And I think it's a bad way to look at a company. I think you have to look at a company almost like a sports team where you need each and every person because of the role that they play. And it doesn't necessarily make one person better than the other, because if one person in the team goes out, the whole team fails. And I think it's a really good idea to about the contribution that every single person can make. And that's what I think is interesting about the mindset, because it's saying to you, every person has a contribution to make. And, you know, if you if you start saying to yourself, oh, well, you know, and they've, they've never really been on board and you know they're difficult they're always complaining i think that is not an indicator of failure of the person that's a failure of leadership because that person doesn't understand they don't feel included they don't see the part that they can play so it's a it's a it's a flip way of looking at leadership so i think that it will be the final comment so rather small steps uh, co-created once with your yeah. uh, team members than the big plan that is like executed from top down perspective well i i ended i think by showing those dolls yeah and i ended by saying that um what we're talking about here is a smart blend of the top down and the bottom up 
And, you know, I'm, I, I find, I would recommend it to people that you think about how does, what does, what, what do we want the employees to be like? So therefore, what do we need the managers to be like? Therefore, what do we need the leaders to be like? Therefore, what do we need our city to be like? Therefore, what do we need the country to be like? Now, those things are never going to line up ideally. But I think there's a great motivation, an inner motivation people have when they understand how their role enables the company to be successful, how it enables the region and the country, company, country, all those things, how they how they sort of connect. What's the role that I play? And when people feel that they really fit in and therefore they're valued, they do really, really great work. They just do. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Paul, um, I think we are uh, slowly running out of time and okay. slowly wrap things up. Um, if there are any uh, final words from you for this webinar to, to our participants regarding the topic. Yeah, I hope that it's given you an insight to the entrepreneurial mindset. And I hope that um, even the brief discussion of the mnemonic has given you a really easy way to very quickly remember what are the key behaviors of the entrepreneurial mindset. You know, it's easy to remember the word, and I hope that, you know, it's fairly easy to remember what the key behaviors are. And I'd really recommend that you use those to prompt your thinking. I think, you know, my, my approach is that you already have all of the knowledge and skills that you need. You already have the ability to generate all of the answers. What the mindset does is it says to you, you are allowed to do all of those things and actually you have the responsibility to do it. So if you're fired up about something and you think it's really important, instead of thinking, why has nobody else done anything about this? Today, ask yourself, what am I going to do about it? And you can go as far as saying to yourself, what am I going to do about it this afternoon? Now, it can all sound very complicated when you get into company strategy and, and you, you're thinking about all those things and it can be a bit overwhelming. And my recommendation is to you is this, that you have a think about who you're going to contact next Monday morning and offer to buy a cup of coffee next week. Because when you boil it down to that, asking yourself that question, who would I contact? What you know, I'm going to buy you a cup of coffee. What are you going to talk about? And the great thing is that then all of your ideas about what you want to work on, the suggestions that you have, become communicated in a very human way. They're not in a plan. They're not written down. They're not in an email. They're just in a conversation. And I would really recommend it to you. I, I, I've got um, colleagues and people I've worked with who actually do use that every Monday. And they think about um, who is the person I'm going to call. And it could be, you know, I, I spend a lot of my time because we've got members in 65 countries. They're virtual cups of coffee. But we get I get I think, right, I really need to talk to this week. Who's going to be the person who really helped me to progress the things that I'm working on? Who do I want to spend some time with? Um, and I think that taking the big corporate hard approach is very important, but blended with the small human approach of buying people coffee. That blend, I think, is very powerful. Great. Thank you very much, Paul, uh, for this really interesting uh, presentation and discussion. And uh, I truly hope that uh, we all liked it. And uh, I think that our participants okay. were also very active. So thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. I hope that we will see you at some point also within our foundation settings and right. if you allow, i will finish up in in polish so yeah. uh, okay <laughs> all right so, uh, bardzo serdecznie dziękuję za, za udział w dzisiejszym webinarze. Zachęcam do, do śledzenia naszej strony internetowej przemysłowości.gov.pl jak również naszych mediów społecznościowych. W przygotowaniu mamy kolejne webinary, na które państwo nie wam, niektóre, na które państwa nie wam zaprosimy dotyczące zastosowania rozszerzonej rzeczywistości i w praktyce firmy oraz standaryzacji 4.0, więc myślę, że jest na co, na co czekać. Jeszcze raz bardzo serdecznie Państwu dziękuję, życzę miłego weekendu, do widzenia, goodbye Paul and have a nice weekend to you. Okay, thank you.